Good morning. Today I will take up the topic on receipt of my mother's picture out of Norfolk, a poem by William Cooper. William Cooper belonged to the transition period and his work, this particular work, is influenced by his nostalgic feelings about his disturbed childhood. His mother died when he was very young and he could not cope with this till late in life. When he was in his fifties, he received a gift from his cousin which was the portrait of his mother. This poem is written in a nostalgic mood. It is autobiographical as is one of the traits of pre-romantic poetry. This is a portrait of Cooper's mother, I'm not saying that this is the portrait to which uh, Cooper probably addressed uh, this poem, but still this uh, is the kind of portrait that he received and he felt that the portrait has come alive and he is actually feeling the presence of his mother before him. He goes back to his childhood and reminisces, reminiscences all that the affection poured by his mother to him. He received this gift in 1790 and this portrait set an atmosphere of spontaneous trepidation of nerves and spirits and inspired one of the most unusual and finest poems of self-revelation in the language that is this particular poem. This poem is related to the 18th century elegy but it represents a new species of reflective meditation, the dialogue of the mind with itself commonly known as the Greater Romantic Lyric. It was published in 1798 and at once entered the canon of essential English poetry. In many ways, it is a tribute to motherhood as the poet brings out the unconditional love that a mother has towards her children which cannot be replaced by anyone. The poet grieves at the loss of his mother and feels lonely without her. The poem brings out the gentle love and cares a mother bestows by simply stroking the head of the child. The poet feels safe and comfortable when his mother is around. The poet feels that his childhood days lived with his mother were the best of his days and wishes to relive those days. A mother's love cannot be compensated and this is very well expressed in the poem. The poem now. Here's the text. The poem contains 120 lines, 
I'll read a few lines and then offer a paraphrase of those lines and then we'll go on to the critical appreciation. Oh, that those lips had language. Life had passed with me, but roughly since I heard thee last. Those lips are thine. Thy own sweet smiles I see. The same that often childhood solaced me. Voice only fails. Else, how distinct they say. Grieve not, my child. Chase all thy fears away. See, the poet has the portrait of his mother before him. And he feels instantly that the image he has in his mind of the mother has come alive and his mother is almost ready to comfort him, to speak to him. So, he begins by surmising that, oh, that lips had language, if only those lips had language. He recalls his rough past life and remembers that it's been long that he has heard his mother's voice. He says that those lips are his mother's, very much of his mother's and the smiles also as he can recollect. He feels that it's the same image that offered solace to him during his childhood. Voice only fails, how distinct they say. Grieve not, my child, chase all thy fears away. These are important lines. He feels that if only the lips had voice, they would again say, ask him rather not to grieve and would tell him to chase away his fears. You see, Cooper had had a very rough childhood. So, he has had some fears throughout. So, it's only his mother's image which is comforting him and telling him to chase his fears away. The meek intelligence of those dear eyes. Now, in brackets, it says, Blessed be the art that can immortalize, the art that baffles time's tyrannic claim to quench it, here shines on me still the same. He says there is that meek intelligence in those eyes and further goes on to say that blessed be art, art has the quality to immortalize time. It can baffle time's tyrannic claim to quench it. Art remains like not. And it shines on him and he is able to recollect his past. Painful remembrancer of one so dear, O oh welcome guest, though unexpected here. He says, The Portrait is the faithful remembrancer of his mother. She's a welcome guest, but unexpected. Why? Because she is no more. Who bids me honor with an artist, with an artless song? Affectionate a mother lost so long. He claims to be producing an artless tale because it's very personal, it's about his personal memories which he is trying to share and maybe it won't be taken easily by the people. Affectionate a mother lost so long, I will obey not willingly alone but gladly as the precept were her own and while that face renews my filial grief, fancy shall be the charm for my relief, shall steep me in Elsian reverie, 
a momentary dream that thou art she. He says, it's good enough to have the portrait before him. He feels his affectionate mother is before him. And for some time, he will believe that the portrait of the mother is not just a portrait, but his mother come alive before him. He will go into an Elsian reverie. He will go into an, a remembrance of something which is not very earthy. He says, let it be a momentary dream and he will feel that the image of his mother before him is actually his mother. My mother, when I learned that thou was dead, he now starts talking to the portrait, to the mother he feels who is before him and tries to relive his childhood. He asks the picture, he asks his mother whether she could feel his sorrow when she died. Sayest, was thou conscious of the tears I shed? Hovered thy spirit over thy sorrowing son? Wretch, even then life's journey just begun. He asks his mother whether she could realize uh, his grief, whether she could realize how many tears he shed. His life journey had just begun when his mother died. Perhaps thou gavest me, though unseen a kiss, perhaps a tear, if souls can weep in bliss. Ah, that maternal smile, it answers yes. And when he poses these questions to the portrait of his mother, who for some time he has believed that is really his mother, he feels that there is a response and the mother seems to be answering him in the affirmative. I heard the bell tolled on thy burial day. I saw the hearse that bore thee slow away. And turning from my nursery window, drew a long, long sigh and wept a last adieu. But was it such? It was. Where art thou, where thou art gone, adieus and farewells are a sound unknown. He then describes the day his mother died. As he heard the bell and he saw her bone away, he could only watch from his nursery window. He sighed and he also wept bid farewell to his mother. And he says that where his mother has gone, adieus and farewells make no sense. May I but meet thee on that peaceful shore, the parting sound shall pass my lips no more. Thy maidens grieved themselves at my concern and gave me promise of a quick return. What ardently I wished, I long believed, and disappointed still, was still deceived. You see, in those days it was a custom uh, which is there even now, to some extent, practiced in many parts of the world, where a young child is not allowed to go near the body of the dead parent or dead relative and is often uh, promised of the return of uh, the parent or the dead person. So his mates kept convincing him kept telling him that the mother will return soon and
He was deceived again and again. By disappointment every day beguiled. Dupe of tomorrow even from a child. Thus many a sad tomorrow came and went. Till all my stock of infant sorrow spent. I learned at last submission to my lot. But though I less deplored thee, never forgot. He says, he was always duped in the name of tomorrow and that tomorrow never came. At last, all stock of his infant sorrow went away, got spent and he learned to submit to his lot. He learned that he had to pass the rest of his life without his mother. But though I less deplored thee, never forgot. He never forgot his mother in spite of being duped again and again with the promise of her return. There are further remembrances of his childhood where once we dwelt our name is heard no more. They've changed the house since then. Children not thine have trod my nursery floor. And where the gardener Robin day by day drew me to school along the public way, delighted with my bobble coach and wrapped in scarlet mantle warm and velvet capped. He remembers there was this huge mansion, there was this lovely house that they resided in and uh, there was this gardener Robin who used to take him to school and he used to be dressed um, in a warm, nice, velvet dress. It has now become a history little known that once we call the pastoral house our own. Short-lived possession, but the record fair that memory keeps of all thy kindness there still outlives many a storm that hath that has effaced a thousand other themes less deeply traced. Till now, where they lived, it has become a history. And he says that all these worldly things are short-lived possession. But the record fair that memory keeps of all thy kindness is still there. And it's still there in his mind. That nightly visits to my chamber made, that thou mightst know me safe and warmly laid, thy morning bounties ere I left my home, the biscuit or confectionery plum, the fragrant waters on my cheeks bestowed by thy own hand till fresh they shone and glowed. He remembers the small things as I mentioned earlier that the mother bestowed upon him. And he used to relish them. She made nightly visits to the chamber to see that he was lying safe and secure and warm. And she used to give him biscuits and confectionaries. And he would, she would sprinkle water on his face. She would clean him, bathe him and, and do the little things that every mother loves to do for her child. All this and more endearing still than all, thy constant flow of love that knew no fall, never roughened by those cataracts and breaks that humor interposed too often makes. These are the beautiful lines for which this poem has become so famous. He says, above all, he can never forget the constant flow of love which his mother showered on him and this love knew no fall no breaks it never came through roughened cataracts or breaks there are many impediments to this constant flow of love but that never happened and it continued all this still legible in my memory's page, 
and still to be so to my latest age. Adds joy to duty, makes me glad to pay such honours to thee as my numbers may. Perhaps a frail memorial, but sincere, not scorned in heaven, though little noticed here. You see the autobiographical element of the poem coming in here. He says all this, the constant flow of love which his mother showered upon him is indelibly printed upon the page of his mind. And he still continues his work. He performs his duties. He yet feels like honouring her, honouring those memories. Through this poem, he has tried to create a frail memorial. This is sincere. This will not be hated in heaven. But it might go unnoticed here. It actually didn't happen. It went noticed and it became an instant hit. Good time, his flight reversed, restored the hours when playing with their vestures to shoot flowers. The violet, the pink and jasmine, I pricked them into paper with a pin. And thou wast happier than myself, the while would softly speak and stroke my head and smile. Could those few pleasant hours again appear? Might one wish bring them? Would I wish them here? The poet remembers those lovely moments of his childhood which he spent with his mother. He used to play with the flowers uh, which were in the pins attached on her headgear and he, he says that she was happier when he played like that with his childhood pranks. She was always appreciative and he again feels whether those pleasant moments could reappear. If he could only wish to have her here. Now, this is the climax of the poem. Why does he wish to bring back the mother's spirit? He wants to live his childhood. But will that happen? I would not trust my heart. The dear delight seems not Seems to be desired, perhaps I might. But no, what here we call our life is such, so little to be loved and thou so much. This is just a momentary thought. And then he uses that bit of logic where he says, No, there are so many hardships in this life. It will never compensate the love that she bestowed upon him and it would not be good to have her back. That I should ill require thee to constrain thy unbound spirit into bonds again. He does not wish to bring back the unbound spirit of his mother. His mother is now in the form of a spirit, in the form of a free spirit and he doesn't want to bring back her into real life because this life is full of hardships. Thou as a gallant bark from the Albion coast, the storms all weathered and the ocean crossed, shoots into port at some well-havened isle where spices breathe and brighter seasons smile. There sits quiescent on the floods that show her beauteous forms reflected clear below where airs impregnated with incense play around her fanning light, her streamers gay. He now compares the spirit of his mother to a gallant bark, to a big ship, to a huge ship. Albion coast is the English coast. 
He says that his mother's spirit is like the huge ship which has faced all the storms and bad weathers and has crossed the oceans and has now shooted into a port which is quiet, which is pleasant, which is well havened island. And this island contains all spices and brighter seasons. She now rests there comfortably, showing her beauteous form which is reflected in the water. And the air is also full of incense, full of scent. Around her, there are steamers which are fanning her. So thou with sails, how swift hast reached the shore. So the ship has reached the shore, the comfort of the shore. Where tempests never beat nor billows roar. There are no tempests, there are no storms and there are no harsh winds blowing there. And thy loved concert on the dangerous tide of life long since is anchored at thy side. The loving concert referred to here is the poet's father. The poet's father is also no more. He has also anchored beside this huge ship. There are two ships there now. Okay? Yeah. But we scarce hoping to attain that rest, always from port withheld, always distressed. He now compares his present state to the comfortable state of his parents were now resting as ships. Me howling winds drive devious, tempest tossed, sails ripped, seams opening wide, and compass lost, and day by day some current snorting force sets me more distant from a prosperous course. He has to face howling winds, he has to cross tempests. His sails are ripped, his seams are opening wide and his compass is lost. That is, he has lost direction in life and he is facing turbulent times each day. But oh, the thought that thou art safe and he, that is the father, that joy, that thought is joy, arrive what may to me. My boast is not that I deduce my birth from loins and throne and rulers of the earth, but higher far may proud pretentious rise the son of parents passed into the skies. He is not proud of his royal lineage. He is more proud that his parents have passed into the skies and are now resting there in peace. And now farewell, time unrevoked, has run his wanted course, and yet what I wished is done. Now he is jolted back into the present, and he feels that time has done its thing, at its duty. That is, for some time he has brought back, time has brought back the memories of his mother, and the mother seems to be comforting him, to be actually speaking to him. The mother's portrait has come alive before him. And he, by contemplation's help, not sought in vain. I seem to have lived my childhood over again. By contemplation, by thought, by meditation, by thinking along, by remembering before that portrait, he seems to have relived his childhood. To have renewed the joys that once were mine without the sin of violating time. He has relived the joys of his time, but he has not, uh, but the joys of his childhood, but has not violated time. That is, he did not resort to doing the wrong, that is, trying to invoke the spirit of his mind. And why the wings of fancy still are free? And I can view this mimic show of the time has but half succeeded in his theft. 
thy remote, thy power to soothe me left. The last lines, the concluding lines of the poem are again very beautiful and oft quoted. He says that while the wings of fancy, while he is able to imagine, see the pre-romantic trait of giving away to imagination, to creativity, is all reflected here. He says, and while his wings of fancy are free, he can view this mimic show again and again. He can have the portrait of his mother before him and again get the feeling that his mother is talking to him, is comforting him, even advising him if necessary. So he says that time has only half succeeded in its theft. Time has taken away his mother. His mother is no more with him. But he has, time has not been able to take away the power to comfort him. The mother's power to confirm, con, uh, to comfort him. That is the end of the text, the paraphrase. And you see, it's, it's intently autobiographical. And you see the nostalgia, you relive, who doesn't want to relive with the thought of having the mother before him or her and you all will agree, you can derive most comfort only from your mother. Mother alone has a power to soothe you where no one in the world can. It is sad but the thought, the revoking of time, thinking about the mother, thinking about her death is all very serious. The poem becomes nostalgic And if it really affects you, everybody has faced with some loss, loss of a parent, loss of a grandparent, loss of a near or dear one and reliving those memories spent with that person again tells you why, what makes this poem such a beautiful poem. You need the paraphrase of the poem, you need to appreciate these beautiful aspects of the poem and of course the extensive comparison which he makes of this mother's spirit with the gallant bark, with the huge ship on the Albion coast, on the English coast is exemplary, is very beautiful. That adds to the beauty of the poem. So in this way, this is again an exemplary transition poem.